This is kind of fascinating. Well, you know what you have here? Real? Nope. Nope. <laughs> a customer trying to sell Rick an overpriced shotgun. A customer who valued his item to be well worth more than the estimates the expert gave. And a customer who brought in a replica, thinking that it was a thousand years old, even though it clearly wasn't. These are the times the Pawn Stars had to deal with customers who were being too smart for their own good. First up, we've got this customer who claimed he's got a very rare photo album made exclusively for the general who has a great presence throughout all the major American conflicts of the 20th century. It's my understanding there's three of these books. We have one, the Patton family has one, and there's one in the National War Archives. This one was signed to my grandfather, G.S. Patton. If the grandfather really had the access to Patton enough to take the shots, Rick believed he must have served too, so he tried to know what position this grandfather held in the army. What rank was your grandfather? Uh, he was a lieutenant at this time. In fact, he was actually about 300 miles behind enemy lines. For Patton was not an easy person to be around from what I understand. Very outspoken. He was always getting in trouble. He was visiting a field hospital and there was a private. The pictures are cool, but what had Rick pretty excited was when he found out some of the pictures were classified, which means they've got their hands on something really valuable. One of the photos back here is actually classified until further notice, right here. Military collectors love this kind of thing, and it could push their value. After the customer expressed his desire to sell the piece, there was no way Rick was going to let this chance pass him by, but he needed to confirm if this was the real deal first. Patton is an iconic figure in American military history. He's one of the greatest generals of all time. At this point, he's wearing four stars. He went from being a three-star general to a four-star general during this period of time. Dana, the expert, knew exactly what to check. Since if it really is real, that means they might be dealing with a huge amount of money here. Starting with the first one that uh, is signed in the photograph, I need to make sure that it's actually signed by him. This is kind of fascinating. Well, you know what you have here? Real? Nope. Nope. <laughs> After all that story about his grandfather having served, it's quite disappointing to discover this holy grail was a complete fake, a copy of the original. So overall for the entire album, I would say that most of these are probably very well known and documented. Since the crown jewel turned out to be a fake, you'd think Rick would send the man off on his way. But since Dana said there's a possibility some of the others that seemed authentic might be ultra rare, Rick decided to go for it. Well, I don't know if this thing's worth 500 bucks. I don't know if it's worth 2,000 bucks. How much you want for it? I heard you say thousands. Would you let your family disown you for 600? <sighs> nah, I better not. Well, that was pretty bad, but wait till you see this one, where a customer brought some super rare novels from as far back as the Civil War era. Definitely got some cool stuff. Dime novels, I mean, right around 1860-ish, a lot of new printing technology comes out. And suddenly drops the price of a book from like a dollar, two dollars for your basic book. Seems he's even got something super special hiding among his very nice collection. I don't know if you've seen this one, but this is actually the most valuable. So this is the first printing of Seth Jones, Edward Ellis, he was the author. Before they can get to cutting deals, it's only fair Rick tries to know how much these books will cost him. So how much you want for these? I'm willing to cut you a deal, $1,500 for the entire collection. Okay, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Let me get someone to take a look at them. I have a friend, she'll know everything about them. Rebecca was called in to check on the books before they could eventually shift on over to negotiating on the price. The mystery pulps, it's an ancestor of Western paperbacks. It's even an ancestor of romance novels that forms what we consider a sort of modern lowbrow reading. So the books are definitely all right. What about the price though? Is it too high or not? He's wanting $1,500 for all these. Okay. Um, is that reasonable or is that complete fiction? <laughs> <laughs> so in my opinion, these all together, you're looking at perhaps 1,500 to 1,750. He really thought he could bump the price higher by pointing out that one book he thought special, but Rebecca had to disagree. A lot of ways as the origin of science fiction. Um, I would dispute that. I mean, science fiction stories were being written by Voltaire in 1740s, like Micromegas. With a price in mind now, Rick and the customer try to negotiate what would be a fair deal for the books, if it could benefit them in any way, that is. So I was looking for 1500 uh, for the entire collection. No, I mean, no? Yeah, I have to make money. I'd give you like 700 bucks for them. You can't. 
You can't. Oh, yeah, so can. this one, this one right here is so hard to find. I could find it. Despite the very tough attempt at negotiating, each party wasn't ready to give in, so the deal could only break down. I'll take, uh, I'll take 1400 Not gonna happen. Okay. Thank you. Have a good one, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. In this episode, this customer claims he's got something so rare he believes Rick has probably never seen anything of its kind ever. This is ancient Aspera dancer statue from the 10th century. Okay, so you had an ancestor who was yeah. in, lived in India or yeah. visited there? Or? I'm from India myself. Okay. Looks pretty nice for what this man claims to be a thousand year relic. Maybe it was preserved nicely. Who knows? Well, Rick's not going to take chances on that. You have people who want to sell them stuff. There was a lot of fakes made, but there was also a lot of people grabbing every old temple and everything they could find to sell it to the British tourists because they had hard currency. So to get it checked out, Rick calls in his ancient arts expert, Dr. Phineas Castle, to help check the statue out. Looking at the exquisite way that it's been preserved and the aging signs if this were sandstone a thousand years old, it would be pitted terribly. With great confidence, the expert revealed the statue actually traces its roots to somewhere else rather than India, where the man thought it came from. Uh, you you want to see it flying, and it usually has feet that are kind of crossed or going up like this, you know, as if it's flying out of the sky. And this is from Cambodia. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so you can see it's just a perfect kind of replication. It is old, but not a thousand years old, which affects the price greatly. Not to mention the fact that it's a replica of a statue from Cambodia, not India, like the customer claimed. Thanks, Phineas. You are welcome, Rick. It's one in a million that I would actually have that photo in my collection, but it's still a beautiful piece. Since it still holds some value, Rick was still willing to get his hands on the item. After all, profit is profit, no matter how little. Are you still stuck on five grand? Like, not anymore. Okay. Can you give me like 700 bucks for it? I'll take a thousand. <sighs> to cut his losses, the customer had no other option than opt for selling it to Rick and get out of Dodge with whatever amount that he could get, rather than to just take it back. I'll give you 800 bucks. 900? No. No. 850? No. I'll do it. Okay, sweet. Over the years, Rick has seen it all, but nothing could ever prepare him for this parchment signed by the best of the best actors and actresses from Hollywood's older generation. I've got probably one of the rarest Hollywood documents you've ever had come to your store. So first off, who's Harry Carey, if it's not the baseball announcer? Harry Carey was like the first major Hollywood blockbuster in Western films back in the silent era. The item is definitely big if it's authentic, but first, how much is this customer hoping to get for it, though? So how much do you want to sell this for? $16,000. Okay. I just don't know how it's going to affect the price. Give me a few minutes. Let me call someone and get them down here and take a look at this thing. Just make sure everything's legit. To confirm its authenticity, Rick asked an expert over to check the signatures. After all, it could be a fake. Well, let's have a look at it. I mean, the first thing I want to do is just, I want to check out the ink on here, and I just want to get a better idea what I'm dealing with. I'm going to start with this Clark Gable. And what I'm looking for is this nice, beautiful, every letter signature. He formed this big G here, it wasn't a straight up cursive capital. And you can see here. Turns out it's as real as it can get, but how much would a piece like this turn out to be? They can only ask Steve for his opinion on that. He is the expert after all. Ink's great. I, I really like the presentation of it all. So based on that, I value this piece right at about $5,000. The customer couldn't even start to believe his ears when he heard how much Steve believes the parchment is worth. But he believed he was right on what the item is worth and refused to even budge a bit on it when it came time to negotiate. Okay, so, I mean, realistically, what would you take for it? I'm really close to 16000 right? How much? 16000 Yeah, I'd give you 3500 bucks for it. I think I'm going to hold on to it, but I thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, there's no way we're going to be able to make a deal. I don't think so. Over the years, the Pawn Stars have had customers who've brought in some of the weirdest stuff ever. In this episode, this customer did the same by bringing in car parts instead of the whole thing, which would have been really, really appreciated. They're much better balanced. You can put a much lower profile on the motor. Porsche engineers really built some fast cars. He actually built it under orders from Adolf Hitler. Where did you get it? I get it from my junkyard. I bought the engine because I want to build that Baja. It's quite rare, all right, but bringing it to the pawn shop isn't really the best thing to do. He could have taken it off to an auto shop where it could have been more appreciated instead. 
But since he's brought it in, Rick might as well just have a look at it. Ocean? Yeah. Because it looks like it's got a lot of water damage. But not inside, just outside. And I asked the guy in the jungle to run it out. How much you want for it? Uh, 4,500. It's a cool motor, but I got some concerns. It looks like water damage. The rust on the engine is definitely worry inducing. It might be damaged for all they know, after all. So it should be quite obvious that they'll be calling an expert over to check it out. Ways to get inside this engine. So what's going on on the surface is, is going to be going on to an extent inside, and that's the unknown. We really don't know what's going on inside there. The seller immediately got too defensive the moment Danny revealed they might have no other choice than to check the engine to understand how extensive the damage is, which is pretty suspect behavior. It's a good engine. It's not going to make you no problems. If you bring a good mechanic, he will tell you what to do. Danny's my man. I mean, this guy can fix anything. Absolutely. He did bring a good one. Not anything. This was tough to watch. That man really insulted Danny when he was only trying to do his job. But being a professional man that he is, Danny had to let that slide. All right. You know, thanks a lot, man. I'm just going to, I'm going to pass. I mean, there's just, it scares me too much. Why bother buying something when the seller refuses to even let them inspect it? The whole thing reeks of a scam and Rick was smart enough to know that he's got to walk away rather than take a chance that could burn him later on down the road. Do you want to make uh, an offer? I don't want to make an offer. And I just don't think the risk reward is here. So thanks for bringing it down. Right. I appreciate it. The customer brings in a really nice shotgun that might have been made for royalty close to 150 years ago, no less. What do we have here? We have a Stephen Grant 10 gauge shotgun. Um, if you look upon the top rib there, there's some pretty significant uh, hand engraving. Being a history buff, there's no way Rick wouldn't take this chance to just geek out over the item in question. Uh, Stephen Grant, he was known for his extremely fancy shotguns. The most elaborate, most beautiful things you've ever seen in your life. Means it was proved at the London Proof House. Every gunsmith, to this day, they still have to do it. You have to bring it to the Proof House, and they fire it with an extra strong charge. Just this is very surprising as a find, but the most surprising aspect of this whole interaction would definitely be the amount of the price tag the seller placed on the shotgun, which was a tad bit too unrealistic. I think this is super cool. Um, so how much do you want for it? So I was thinking about starting at 800000 I can guarantee you the Prince of Wales would have never shot this. He never owned it at all. Well, that's one way to cut the poor man's expectations short. Just because it had a historically significant person's name emblazoned on it doesn't really make it some super rare item that could upgrade it to being worth that much. And even if it was, there's no way Rick would ever want to place that much on a shotgun. $3,000 for it. Well, I appreciate the offer, but I think I'm going to keep it. Okay. If you change your mind, okay. come back. Um, have a great one. When it comes to antique firearms, there are a few experts on Rick's list who are as knowledgeable as the international military antique expert, Alex Cranmer. Though this weird piece of what might be a firearm has this expert stumped. He has never seen anything like it before. We have the Swiss Army knife of pirate legs. <sighs> I mean, intrigued is an understatement. Let me see this thing. I don't think it's a movie prop. I think it's much too sophisticated for it. I mean, it looks like it would function. Nice. Right? Nice. Sweet. Even if the firearms expert, Alex, has never seen anything like this prosthetic weapon, he has worked with enough weapons to recognize that the design of the prosthetic is consistent with that of a weapon. Alex is fairly certain that this item is not a prop. But there is only one way to be sure. What would happen is if this was a British officer's leg and he was injured in battle, you're out to sea for months. So he wants 15 grand for it. I got to research it. And if it fires, that'll help the value a lot. Can you meet us at the range in the morning? Sure. Alex will take any excuse to test a firearm at the range. So he is pretty excited to give this leg a shot. And honestly, so am I. The testing went better than the seller, buyer, and expert expected. Once again, Alec has done his job, and he has done it well. But I'm using a little bit of powder and a smaller ball. Little pressure, less of an accident. Lots of pressure, big accident. <laughs> yes! Got a hit. Went right through it. It fires. Rick has been drooling over this unusual leg gun and has been hoping it is the real deal. So it is not weird that he would want to fire it. He also wants to know the value of the gun, which is not an easy task, considering the rarity, but Alex gets it done. Ready? Here we go. 
I got a flesh wound. I got a flesh wound. What do you think it's worth? Somewhere in the twelve to $15,000 range. Awesome. It's pretty amazing, Rick. Alex's appraisal puts a smug look on the face of Dennis, the seller, who now knows he has the high ground in this negotiation. Rick really wants the shooting leg, so he does not try too hard negotiating with Dennis. In the end, all the parties, seller, buyer, and expert, leave the range satisfied. I'm looking at 15. No, 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 there's, there's no money to be made. Come back at me. We go nine? Call it nine and a half. 9,500? 9, you got a deal. Rick does not know much when it comes to rock stars and the tools of the rock star trade. But he knows just the man for the job of appraising what could be one of the best tools to have when it comes to Rockstar Sound. What year is this? 1973 100 watt Marshall head in the 4x12 cabinet. All tube? All tube. There's nothing like the Marshall sound. All the great guitarists over the years have used them. Mind if I have someone check it out? Not at all. Okay, I'll be right back. Um, I got a buddy who'll know everything. There is only one way to test if this Marshall sound system is the real deal, and that is to go rock and roll. Jesse is the man who is ready to go rock and roll on a moment's notice. As soon as he brings out his guitar, you know things are about to get real loud. So what do you think it's worth? I'm gonna have to, you know, power it up and stuff and make sure it works. Well, let's plug it in and see what happens here. Works. <laughs> the quality and worth of this Marshall system are expertly determined by the sound expert, who is ready to poach this deal if Rick is unable to close the deal. But, so uh, what's this, this thing worth? The transformers, tubes, and everything pretty much seem original in this amplifier. Close to three grand for the setup. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if Rick doesn't buy this one, I'm gonna follow the guy on the parking lot, I'm gonna buy it. It's, it's a great sounding amplifier. Both prospective buyer and seller enter the negotiation stage based on Jesse's appraisal. The negotiation is heated, but Rick manages to stir the deal in his favor. Jesse, who must be waiting in the parking lot, would be a bit disappointed he couldn't get the Marshall for himself. 2800 No, I mean, I'll go 2100 bucks. I mean, you have to, I got a business here to run. You do a little more, 2200 All right, you got a deal, dude. I'll give you 2200 bucks. Great. Here's up front, and uh, we'll do some paperwork. Alrighty. A seller brings in an interesting and very realistic toy into the shop. This toy bazooka looks so realistic that if you went with it to the airport, the TSA would arrest you on suspicion of outright terrorism. That's really cool until you walk into an airport with it, then you're going to jail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I mean, it looks very real. A rocket propelled grenade could hit a tank, bounce off it, ricochet 20 feet and blow up that way. I mean, a single guy can take out a tank with one of these. That's pretty impressive. Corey decides to test the weapon, and Rick finds out the hard way that this weapon is not as harmless as advertised. So what, you just pull the trigger now? Yeah, it should be ready to go. All right, hey, Pops. <laughs> Damn, son. I'm sure my dad will be all right after he cries it off for a few hours. But this goes to show you, toys have come a long way in the safety department. The weapons testing put the seller in a real awkward situation. I don't think anyone would want to sue him for Corey's wrong, but he is smart to worry about that. Yeah, I mean, this is like 50 years old, still all the original box, so I think it's really a unique item. I hope he's okay, and I hope this doesn't screw up my deal. Johnny Jimenez is the go-to expert on toys, and he does not fail to deliver on this very deadly toy. There is no dispute from Black Eyed Rick or the seller as to Johnny's knowledge and expertise when he gives his appraisal. On Johnny's part, he is just stoked to have seen a wonderful toy. You're a little <laughs> Corey. Well, at least we know it works. No, I'm not responsible for any of this, am I? <laughs> <laughs> it's very uncommon to see these in good condition. Uh -huh. All this here is cardboard. Well, this is cardboard, this is plastic. Seeing that it's 100% complete, you got all the original paperwork. In this condition, pushing it a little bit, but you could ask 500 for this piece. The negotiation is tougher than what Corey expected. He will earn no points from Rick for how he handled that transaction. The deal was probably not worth the black guy Rick got, but there is no profit without a little sacrifice. That being said, I can't pay you 500 bucks, otherwise I'd make no money. Yeah. I'll offer you around 200 bucks for it. We could meet in the middle. At no, we're not. 350, man. 375, come on. All right, 375, there we go. A very ancient mummy mask walks into the shop with a customer who is willing to let it go for a hefty price. Corey does not know much about this piece, so the question is, who do you call when you have a mummy in the building? I have an Egyptian carcinage mummy mask. Hey, Corey, there's a mummy in the shop. How old is it? It is believed to be from second century AD. This is just a little out of my realm here. 
You mind if I have a friend of mine come down and take a look at it? Phineas Castle, the mummy expert, is exactly how you would have imagined a mummy expert. He looks, talks, and walks like he has been in many mummy grave sites. He gives his expert advice, and there is no doubt he knows what he's talking about. This one is unusual because here's the deceased riding on the back of a lion. That would only happen with a royal person. This particular mask, it's in great condition, but it's not an easy sale. That's going to be a very unique person who's going to want to. Corey, once again, finds himself in another heated negotiation. Despite Phineas's appraisal, the seller is not willing to come down on his new price. Corey has to swallow his pride and take the seller's price, which is a rare occurrence on the show. I would take 30000 for you. I don't like having that much money out waiting, whether it's six months or five years before somebody came, comes in and buys this. If I can't get $30,000, i am just going to have to probably walk away. All right, you want thirty for it? I'll do thirty right now. Right now? Right now. I'm, it's, you ready? $30,000. $30,000. My man, you got a deal. All right. The legendary Katana. A woman enters the pawn shop with a special item from the days when samurais roamed free in feudal Japan. This item leaves Rick and Chum Lee sufficiently impressed. Looking to see if maybe you'd be interested in uh, purchasing this sword. Oh, wow. Are you a closet samurai or something like that? No. <laughs> The upside of being a soldier of war is not just the steady pay, but also the chance of getting some sweet loot. However, there is a chance that the 16th century ceremonial sword was used to do some really dark business. It's a great piece of history. During World War II, there was this whole thing called the spoils of war and war prizes. Might sound a little strange now, but it just goes back from thousands of years. The kids said it was a sword used for beheading Christians. Um... I mean, I have never heard of the Japanese beheading Christians. Rick has to examine the sword for himself. This gives Chum Lee a much-needed chance to teach Rick one or two things about sword safety. Rick, in turn, gets Chum Lee to give some history on the Japanese blade. Chum Lee's effort is laughable. Don't be touching that, Rick. You know better than that. What have I taught you over the years? What have you taught me? Yeah. Not to touch that with your hands. So what can you tell me about this, Chum? It definitely looks like it was used probably beheaded, you know, an out-of-line boss once or twice in its time. It's Rick's ironclad rule to have someone more knowledgeable look at items he knows little about. The expert he calls displays great skill and knowledge as he examines what he claims is indeed a great piece of history. 10,000. Okay. Uh, to per be perfectly honest, I have no idea what it's worth. It's in need of some reconditioning, I'll tell you that. Yes. This blade was made in 1863 by Nagahiro and was given to the Lord of Choshu to protect Japan against enemies of the emperor, the imperial family. Rick is still bothered by the possibility that the sword has been used to commit religious genocide. The expert puts this worry to rest by interpreting the text, which conveniently states the sword's purpose, a purpose not for what Rick feared. There is a term called joy that's written on the tang, which means protecting or reverence to the imperial family. One of Rick's worries about the katana has been put to rest. Now he wants an appraisal and gets one that leaves the seller pleasantly surprised. With his work done, the expert honors the weapon like a real samurai and takes his leave like one too. What an intriguing man. The question, what's it worth? Well, in its present condition, probably worth about $10,000. Wow. Rick knows enough about the sword to kick off negotiations. It's at this point Rick makes the most insane and unexpected move since the show started. It's a gesture that'll warm your heart to see. Five? Can you make money at that? I don't take advantage of people. Uh, Five thousand is just too low. I will give you six thousand dollars for it. I'm assuming six thousand is fine since you wanted five. <laughs> yes, six thousand okay. is great. Okay. I'm still in shock. I never imagined Rick would ever willingly pay more money than he has to for an item, even one as special as this katana. Chum Lee, on his part, must be wondering whether Rick has gone soft and seriously considers using the special sword on Rick. I'm gonna write this ticket up, and then I might behead you with this sword, Rick. Oh, oh. <laughs> World War II mixed with rock and roll. Rick rarely has any relationship with his customers, as a rule. Chum Lee chooses to follow a different philosophy, which is evident from the way he welcomes Jason not just as a customer, but also as a friend. It's always interesting to see what you're going to bring in. Heck yeah. This is pretty cool, man. Where'd you get this? 
So Margie died, and I was at her estate sale. That tear right there is gonna affect the value, but definitely really cool though. I mean, I've seen this album hundreds of times. Although Chumley wants to do things his way, he also shows that he has learned one or two things from his pawn shop mentor, Rick. The shows and how he negotiates, and he even uses Rick's famous or infamous catchphrase. This man might be the next Rick Harrison. If you could do 350 for the pair. This is me taking a risk, 140. <laughs> That's the best I can do. <laughs> and I'm only buying it because... I'll do 140. I like you and I... One thing about Chum Lee is that he's not ashamed to show off his pawning skills, especially to Rick. As expected, Rick and Chum Lee butt heads over the right way to treat customers. Who has the better customer philosophy between Rick and Chum Lee? Any airline I ever seen. Why don't you call like MHP because he runs a aviation museum. I made an executive decision. I'm guessing that Snoopy patch alone is worth some money. Jason no, is no, the you man. No, no, you don't always get, do good off the stuff. Yes, Jason's the man. He brings me good stuff. We got a relationship No, no, going. no, no, he doesn't care about you. He cares about our money. Chum Lee once again embarks on a mission to prove his mentor wrong. He checks the rock and roll albums with his professional on all things music, who confirms that Chum Lee has indeed hit an insane gold mine with these albums. In expert's opinion, I'm going to have my man Clint look at these Black Sabbath records. Let him tell me I got a couple hits on my hand. Somebody had hung it on their wall. Yeah, it looks like it was taped and... and yeah, there's some tag marks and stuff. As a whole, you'd be looking at $1,200. Whoa. Let's just take a moment to appreciate Chum Lee's victory dance. Records, I've got one more stop on the Proving Rick Wrong tour. And I can't wait for the sweet, sweet taste of victory. Chum Lee consults MHP, the legendary expert on all things Vietnam. MHP confirms that Chum Lee was both right and wrong about this piece. But he also confirms that he is more right than wrong about this item. Another win for the porn star. A stewardess dress, but it's not. One of the things that you would never see on a stewardess dress is patches that don't relate. I think you have a very interesting piece that does have a lot of value, but the value is in the patches. Chum Lee comes in to boast to his boss and Corey about his jackpot purchase. However, all he wants is for his boss to give him a pat on the back, literally, which is a surprisingly heartfelt moment. 700 for the Black Sabbath self-titled. I think that's 1200. You did a good job, Chum. Can I get a pat on the back? No, I'm not going to go that far. Just a little pat on the back. Just a little one. Chum Lee might have exceeded Rick's expectations, but he definitely does not need another Chum Lee in his pawn shop. Why can't you be more like Chum? Oh, I can be like Chum. I can be like Chum all day long if you want. The Mummy 4, Corey's Trials. The next item is as rare as it is old, all the way from the second century AD. Corey keeps a straight face, but it's obvious he wants this ancient mummy mask. Taking a cue from Rick, he minimizes his risk and calls in a mummy expert. Hey, Corey, there's a mummy in the shop. How old is it? It is believed to be from second century AD. What are you looking to get out of it, my man? I would like to get 70000 The mummy expert looks exactly how you'd expect a mummy expert to look. He looks like Brendan Fraser's nerdy assistant. It's no surprise he knows what this mummy is and also its worth. It's missing its mask. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it real? This is real. What do you think it's worth? 20000 to like maybe twenty two five. This has to be the most insane negotiation to ever occur on the show. This customer refused to budge. Usually it's the other way around. He even has Corey showing weakness. Who is this man? Bottom line, man, what's the what's the lowest you'll go? Thirty thousand. I'll go twenty one. If I can't get thirty, I'm just gonna have to I'll go twenty I'll go I'll go twenty two. I'm gonna pass, man. I'm sorry. This customer just pulled off something special. Since this show aired in two thousand and nine, this is the first time I've seen a customer get called back. Even Jum Lee can't believe what he just saw. <clears throat> All right, you want 30 for it? $30,000. $30,000. My man, you got a deal. All right, deal. Corey knows Rick will chew him out when he hears about this, but Corey knows this ancient mummy is a gold mine, so he reckons it's a worthy sacrifice. Chumley, guard that with your life. The old man's going to kick my now. Rick loves antique guns, so when he hears there's a big one, you know he'll check it out. A customer called the shop and she has a knock volley gun. She lives in Boulder City and the gun range is right in the middle, so I figured that's where we'd meet. I'm not going to say it, but some might say, well, you know what some might say. That is a big oh. gun. Whoever made this gun wanted the enemies of his customers dead. 
Who puts seven barrels on a gun? Seven barrels in one gun. So have you fired this thing? I have not. I was nervous to shoot it because of the amount of kick that it probably has. The woman was wise not to shoot the gun, but Chumley was not afraid of the risk. To his credit, he handled the weapon well. Everyone liked that. I definitely want to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Yee-hoo! Oh, that's how you do <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. The gun is appraised, and a fast back and forth ensues between buyer and seller. It ends with everyone being satisfied with what they got. I would value this at thirty-five to forty thousand dollars. Okay. You know what? I'll give you the thirty grand for it. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. I got a gun, dude. Oh man. <laughs> I'm gonna do all right in this. I think I'll get close to forty thousand for it. Rick, the tank operator. Rick is still buzzing with excitement, which only increases as he and his staff are en route to a classified location to test out a weapon of mass destruction. You'll understand why Rick is excited when you see it. Apparently, there's an authentic Sherman tank for sale that was used, get this, in Iwo Jima during World War II. It doesn't get much better than that. All right, we're here. Look at that tank. Holy sh That is amazing. This hunk of metal monstrosity looks hardcore and dangerous, as it also has a loaded amount of history. Plus, it's in unbelievably good condition for a weapon that has seen some World War II action. What I'm looking at right now is an M4A3 Sherman. What makes this tank special, it's the only Sherman tank in private hands that was actually used in the Pacific Theater real Marines jumped into during Iwo Jima. I look at it, I just find it incredible because, it, I mean, it's from Iwo Jima. I mean, it's like when they raised the flag on Mount Suribashi, I mean, it's probably the most iconic photo of all of World War II. Chumley makes a shocking discovery about this armored tank. But the way the seller explains it just adds to the value of this iconic war machine. Well, guys, there's a major problem with this tank. It's made out of wood. You know what that's for? The Japanese had magnetic mines, sticky mines, that they would run up and stick to the side of a tank. It's adorable to see a 58-year-old man act like an 8-year-old kid who got a chance to play with his favorite toy. Of course, Rick has to ensure everyone sees him do it. How much you want for this thing? I'm looking to get a million and a half. That kind of money... I'm thinking about it, but before I do anything, I'm going to have to fire it. Wish me luck. <laughs> you got it. No worries. This has to be the most exciting weapons testing of Rick's life. I would like to tell you that no cars were harmed in this video, but I'd be lying. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh man. This has been the greatest day of my life, by the way. Not when you were born, Corey. No. The money involved in this transaction is so much, everyone knows that Rick, Alex, the owner, and the cameraman need all the privacy they can get. At any major battle in the World War II, and it was sold for 1.2 million, so at one and a half million, I, I think that's a fair price. Okay, let's get out of here. <laughs> Rick comes clean with Alex. He could never afford to buy the tank. He just wanted an excuse to fire a tank. Alex doesn't mind. He's made money from Rick anyway. This sadly goes down as the jackpot that got away. It's amazing. It's got amazing history. Everything about it is absolutely great. But um, I'd so out of the ballpark for me, man. <laughs> but I really, really appreciate the day. It's been an unbelievable day. Book of Mormon. A customer named Adam brought in his copy of the 1842 Book of Mormon. Brought for you a book, the Book of Mormon. It's definitely the book. It's even harder to get this than tickets to the play. Be really difficult then. <laughs> Adam tells Rick the defining features of the item and the price he's asking for. It's really important to American history. All right, is it an older version of it? This one wasn't printed in many copies, maybe 600 something copies, $25,000 for it. Rick decides to call in Rebecca, his book expert, to check the book out. By far the most valuable book you've ever had me appraise. Later editions don't hold a ton of value. These early editions of the Book of Mormon will still hold a lot of collectible value. I would appraise this book actually at about $40,000. You're the best. Happy to help. Rebecca gives her estimate and takes her leave, kickstarting the negotiation for the book. What's your best price? I really think it's a $40,000 book. You'll sell it. There's a lot of demand for it. Do 24000 This time I'll give it to you, so we'll do okay. it that way. It's a deal. Being a repeat customer, Adam eventually agrees to sell the book that was appraised to be worth $40,000 for $24,000. Vic Flick's guitar. An elderly customer brought in a very rare guitar he was hoping to sell. It's a 1961 Fender Stratocaster. A 
That's a big wow factor right there. The customer makes a revelation that shocks Rick. So where did you get this thing? I've worked on records with uh, Petula Clark. So were you like a studio mus I musician? Was. I was. I was. 1983. To prove how valuable the guitar is, he shows Rick the songs he performed with it. The, the records that I played on. This is how many albums you've been on? Well, albums and films. So you worked on films too? Goldfinger, James Bond. James Bond theme. Yes. Impressed with the history of the guitar in his presence, Rick asks for the price. How much are you looking to get out of it? $70,000. Um, I'm going to call someone up who knows everything about guitars. Does your name make it worth that much? So he'll be okay. down a little bit. Okay. All right? Sure, right no back. problem. Rick brings in his guitar expert to check the piece out. You know, a really good condition probably be about a $35,000 guitar. You've heard this guitar probably more times than you even realize. Easily $60,000, $70,000. This is like beyond cool. After Jesse confirms the guitar's validity while gushing at the owner, he gives an estimate that's precisely what the owner was asking for, an excellent sign to Rick, who starts talking about the price as soon as Jesse takes his leave. We take 50 grand for it. I'm looking more towards the 70, maybe 65. Rick tries to shave as much as he can off the price. It's nothing personal, I'm just thinking, I mean, you're sort of a rock star. Um, do you go 60? I, I, I think that's a fair price. All right. Deal. Yeah. Lincoln Parlor Card. The customer, named Greg, brought in a signed parlor card of the 16th President of the United States into the shop for Rick to see. I have an original Lincoln Parlor card. Pretty amazing, the ones that he signed. He did the image for the $5 bill and the cent, and this is the basis of the Lincoln penny. When Rick discovered it was the particular portrait used as a basis for the penny, he was more than ready to have it. I didn't know what existed in private hands. This is the only one left, so I think a fair price is $100,000. That's a lot of cents. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get someone in here who'll have a better idea what it's value. Right. I'm just in shock. To confirm if the item was what the seller claimed it to be, Rick called in Stuart Lutz, his historical documents expert. Brought in some examples of authentic Lincoln signatures here. Angle of the O, 45 degrees upwards. Lower point and top point make that 45 degree angle. It is genuinely signed by our 16th president himself. Having confirmed the authenticity of the portrait, Stewart gives an estimate of what he thinks the item might be worth. What's it worth? You probably put a price of $150,000. Thanks. Sure. The item's price turns out to be more than the seller thought it was, so he tried to get more of the deal. I mean, like, what's your best price on it? Hey, you could make money even if you gave me 120. I'll give you the 100 grand. I won't go a penny more. That's what I'll go. Despite all of Greg's attempts to get more on the item, Rick remains dead set on paying precisely what he asked for initially. I think 110 is a fair price. Hundred thousand dollars, and that's it. We had a deal. I'll get you paid. Right. And then you can pay the IRS. We look similar, don't we? Yeah. Scottish pistols. On one of his rare trips out of the shop, Rick takes a trip to London after getting a lead on some very nice items for his weapon expert, Alex. Peter's the father. Rolly and Red also work with him. From the looks of it, you definitely have some incredible stuff here. We have an old back crew. So that's where you keep the good stuff. Follow me. All right. After getting acquainted with the finers, Rick and Alex get escorted to see the rarest pieces of the shop in their back room. Oh, so this is where the real fancy stuff is at. A lot of the pieces here have um, fascinating provenance. Pair of pistols here by John Christie. Redmond shows Rick the Highland dress pistol that was made to be worn by old Scott aristocrats and royals during the 19th century. What are they made out of? These are gilt brass stock. And all of this, is, how is all of this work done? Chiseled and engraved, yeah. Yeah, that's just amazing. You don't find all steel pistols anywhere else really in the world. While admiring the firearms, Rick finds another that catches his eye. What's that one right there, the ivory one? So this is um, made in 1600 in Germany. Redmond introduces the finest piece of weaponry to the curious Rick. So that, that's a wheel lock. Hey, check this thing out. It's beautiful. That starts, once you let it go, it starts to spin, and all the sparks come up, which fires the gun. Alex explains how the gun works to the curious Rick. It, incredibly complicated. How many did you say? Three? Three have ever come onto the art market. <laughs> Impressed with the firearms, Rick asks for the price. Wheel lock's 140,000 pounds. I think I'll pass on this one. How much are these? 100,000 pounds. Great condition, a work of art. So would you take 80,000 pounds for them? With the Staghorn pistol out of the way, Rick settles for the less expensive pair of pistols. I would take 90,000 pounds for them. I'll take 85,000 pounds. You have a deal. All right. All right. <laughs> I mean, they're fantastic. I'm thrilled. I shouldn't be in here any longer. I might buy something else. Steven Stills gives a guitar. A piece of rock and roll walks into the gold and silver pawn shop that had Rick all hot and bothered. And a piece of rock and roll history for you here. 
This is a 1941 Gibson SJ200. That is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Worried about the item that's too good to be true, Rick asks for the convincing evidence. And you have, like, documentation this was Stephen Stills? He signed a bill of sale. I have that. OK. Bill of sale. This is to verify the sale of a Gibson J200 guitar. You know what? It adds a little bit to it. Because if you're going to fake it, who the hell would do that? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having confirmed the validity of the guitar, Rick finds an issue with the guitar's appearance. It looks like someone did refinish this at one point. I think it's got a light overspray on it. It just looks like there's been some work done to it. Pre-war Gibson, which makes it worth money. And I assume you know that. <laughs> Before he takes the next step, Rick asks for Landon, the seller's asking price. I'm looking to get 110,000 for it. Sounds like a lot. I don't know everything about guitars. So I'm gonna call in my, um, my buddy Jesse and maybe we'll do business, okay? Hoping to cover all bases, Rick calls in an expert. This is a really, really cool one. You can see it's had a couple of crack repairs and stuff, so it's kind of par for the course with a guitar this old. They didn't gob a ton of finish on it. These guitars sound so good. Jesse tried to answer all of Rick's queries as best as possible. Some documentation saying that this was owned by Stephen Stills. Gotta add something, right? Yeah, yeah, it does a lot, actually. I mean, mind if I strum a chord or two on it? Go ahead, man. Yeah, it's cool. Having had fun with a guitar, Jesse gives an estimate of what he believes the guitar is worth. It's an expensive guitar, man. <laughs> okay. Probably worth anywhere between 75 and 90 grand. What does Stephen Stills add to it? 20, 30,000. This is it. This is the one. If you're going to buy one, this is the only one that's available. After Jesse takes his leave, Rick decides to negotiate for an affordable price. I mean, what's your best price on it? Give me 110. We'll make it a deal. I'll give you 80 grand. I think you can do 80. No, I don't think I can do 80. That's my line, man. Landon proves himself a very tough negotiator, refusing to bow to Rick's pressure. I'll give you 85. Change your mind, call me. 85, man. All right. <laughs> You'll have cash, and I'll have a guitar I gotta sell. Boxing is a popular sport and has produced a lot of famous people. Bill's ticket is highly collectible, and hopefully, he will make a decent profit off it. I got a 1984 Olympic boxing ticket stub with a few autographs on it you might be interested in. And I know the signature's right off the bat. That's a Vander Holyfield and Mike Tyson. Even though Bill is attached to the ticket, he's ready to part with it for the right price. The ticket does have a little sentimental value. The time that I spent with the Olympic boxers was special. You take it with you, and you can do some good with the money. I'm hoping to get $500 for this ticket stub. Bill had a personal relationship with the stars before they became famous, which is very cool. Tyson and Holyfield fought in 1996. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. He just wasn't prepared to fight Holyfield. The second time, 1997, Tyson said he was sick of getting headbutted, so he decided to, for whatever reason, bite off Holyfield's ear. Corey is very interested in the item, but isn't sure of the actual value. What do you think the ticket is worth? Interesting here, I've never seen anything like this. You know, if you just brought me uh, my long before they were really famous or anything like that, I mean, I think it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of interesting. Do you mind if I have a guy come in and take a look at the signatures? Please do. All right, um, I'll be back in a few. Steve is wary because getting the two signatures on the same piece is incredibly rare. You know, these guys were both kids back then. Tyson was just, uh, you know, an amp, and Holyfield was a couple years older than a lot of kind of rough areas, you know, and then... Authenticating the signatures is difficult because of their rarity, but Steve confirms they are genuine after a while. This is from one of the only I've ever seen signed, and it's literally the same type of signature. I'll tell you the truth, you got a winner here. Okay. So Bill is excited about going home with much more than he thought, thanks to Steve's high appraisal of the ticket. So you're looking at about $2,000. Wow. <laughs> My kids told me it was going to be a big hit, but I thought not that big of a hit. Corey and Bill bargain, and Bill chooses to hold on to his ticket. Would he get a better offer, or should he have sold it? What do you take for it? 1500 I think I'll stay at 1500 You know, well, please do, okay? I appreciate Take that. Take care. The item Paul brings to the store is a sports collector magnet. I got a football helmet signed by 28 Heisman Trophy winner. I feel like I need to wear one of these things every once in a while. I have an employee, um, John Blake. He's a walking hurricane. When I'm around him, I just feel in danger. <laughs> Paul wants to make some money off his Heisman helmet. But to do that, Rick needs to be convinced the signatures on it are legit. Amelia, I don't think they're in business anymore. Um, there's limited edition of 500, so obviously Steiner Sports lined up 500 helmet, eventually got them all to sign them, which is really cool. Do you know how the name Heisman came to be? It started in 1935, a year after they came out with the trophy. So they renamed the trophy the Heisman Trophy. So how much you want for this thing? There's a ton of people that wouldn't want to collect this thing. My problem is, let me get my buddy down here. For sure. All right, I'll be right back. 
Steve checks out the signatures and tells Rick what he thinks of them. It went out of business years ago. Signature, you see that same S in there, almost is identical. Jay Berwanger, first Heisman winner. And so all the signatures are legit. His valuation of the helmet puts it at more than double Paul's asking price. More money can be made if Paul can negotiate properly with Rick. I would put the value of this, Rick, right about $2,500. That's wonderful. Yeah, you've got a lot of upside here. At $1,450, Paul makes a lot more than he bargained for. You want 800 bucks? 1600 I got to make a living here. I really like 14 better. I'll do 1450 That's the best I'm going to do. All right, let's do it. More memorabilia are sometimes worth a lot and are quite easy to sell. What exactly do you got here? It's a World War II ammunition hand cart. All right, do you know what you're Chum Lee is skeptical about the condition of the cart and might want to pay less for it. Rusty old car with broken down tires. What else do you need to know? <laughs> Believe it or not, I got it out of a garbage pile. It looks like it belongs in a garbage pile. <laughs> Shane is no expert on what the cart was for and bought the item for a different purpose. So how would this work? Would you, like, hook it up to a horse? I imagine there was a handle right there, but just moving stuff around. The thing's built like a tank. Rick sheds more light on the cart's history and the important role of patriots in the war. It's from World War II, I imagine. But, you know, most people don't realize this. In World War II, there was no cars made for personal use. The saying was, stop making what you're making, start making stuff for the war. Shane's ask is a bit high, and Rick doesn't want to negotiate without getting an expert's input. So obviously it didn't sell for $500. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. My problem is I don't even know if it'd be worth fixing up. And if it's not worth restoring, he might buy it. All right. All right. Bob believes the cart is valuable and an actual piece of the war. Oh, and they're friggin' hard fun. Good news for me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> really, it's not in bad shape. You got all the original uh, kegs and everything. Original wheels, bearings, which is hard. So how much is this thing worth the way it's Rick still isn't sure he should acquire the cart, but Bob's valuation changes his mind. These were selling for $1,500, $2,000 in this condition. Really? If it looks like the real thing, they're happy with it. All right, so tell me, how much would it cost to restore it? Probably talking about for a serious collector, this is a must-have. Shane is okay with Rick's offer and walks away $400 richer. Was it fair or could he have gotten more for the cart? What do you think? I'll give you 400 bucks for it. I know he said it was worth a lot more, but I'll give you 400 bucks. I pay him 12 to 1400 to restore it. Take 400 if you'll take a picture of it when you finish it. Yeah, I'll send you a picture when I finish That'd it. That'd be cool. All right. Hey, 400 bucks, man. Thanks. After the restoration, the cart looks great, and Rick will make a massive profit if he decides to sell it. It was just a tough flight this thing had. You were telling me before, these sell for like $2,500? I'll be honest with you, I would start at $2,800. It's the sixth vehicle, headquarters, third division, so you should be able to get a good price for it. Items from World War I are rare finds and highly collectible. A potential seller, Chris, brings one into the store with hopes of making a reasonable sum. I'm doing great. Uh, I have an old helmet from around World War One-ish. It's pretty neat. Um, not the most protective thing in the world. And some poor bastard had to wear this to protect his head. <laughs> Rick is intrigued by the item and the bloody history behind its creation and use but wants to ensure it's legit. It was a brutal, terrible war. They called it a war of inches because literally they would fight for days just to get a few feet. No one had ever fought a large scale war with poison gas before and high speed machine guns made it even worse. So the soldiers- Paul is an expert on war history and thoroughly checks the helmet to determine if it is legit. Marine Corps ones are a lot rare, a lot more desirable, which means people fake them a lot more. And people are really good at faking this stuff. That's exactly what my concerns are. Someone faked that thing. Okay, I'll take a closer look. I got some news for you guys. I think it's definitely real. His conclusion is very pleasing to Chris, who was surprised by the new valuation of this item. So what do you think it's worth? Well, in today's market, uh, I'd say somewhere between $900 and $1,500. Okay. Since the item was initially undervalued, Chris changed his asking price and negotiated with Rick for a better deal. All right, so how much do you want for it? Well, 13 No, that's not going to happen. I'd really like to get $1,000. Um, I'm thinking more like 500 bucks. Uh, would you be willing to go 950? I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go 700 bucks. I mean, I, I have a bit. He's a great negotiator and leaves the store with almost double his initial ask. How about 750? All right, 750. All right, thank you. All right, you wanna write him up? Let's go do some paperwork, my man. James brings an over 900 year old antique to the store, which immediately pricks Rick's interest. All right. Whoa, I okay. mean, this is definitely some money right here. The Viking collection is an exciting piece of history and probably worth as much as James wants, if not more. Do you have an idea what you wanted for this stuff? Uh, I was thinking around a thousand bucks. 
Okay, um... Rake believes James is onto something with his collection, especially if the items are legit. Are really intriguing. I think it's what's left of a copper bracelet. Okay. It's my favorite piece out of all of them. Did you know much about the Vikings? I mean, just in general? I knew they were bullies. Um, and yeah, that's basically what they did. These were the most iron men you ever seen in your life. The expert sheds more light on the Viking history and James's collection. If we look at I, what I'd say is, is this group of items right here. This is diagnostically Baltic Viking. Like, technically, it's, it's not Viking. It is part of a bracelet. Okay. Um, it's, it's a copper owl. You know, this item is probably worth $50. Okay. While the appraisal of some parts of the collection is not impressive, the other items compensate for James's loss. I would say it would appear from its form and how it's manufactured. The auction estimates on it would be something between you know, 6,000 to 8,000 British pounds, which would be, I'll, I'll leave it to you to translate. 6,000 pounds would be right around uh, 9,400 bucks. <laughs> With the new information available, James sees the opportunity to strike cash gold with his gold. I don't have a lot of customers going, hey, dude, I'll go, I'll go $200. <laughs> <laughs> now this right here, I was thinking right around $6,000. Oh, $8,000. Just settle with that, buddy. Okay, all right. John has some items he wants to sell to raise money for a noble cause in the store. I've got a couple of autographed albums here. They're real special to me. Fleetwood Mac and Elton John, huh? Yes, sir. I was in the radio business for around 25 years. Oh, you're in radio, huh? Yeah. You definitely got a voice for it. Thank you. <laughs> Corey gives some interesting facts about the albums and the artists. He's interested in the items, but wants to call in an expert to determine their worth. So uh, what are you looking to get for? I was thinking uh, 200 each, a fair price. I'm no expert. I don't know what autographs go for. OK, um, so I'll tell you what. You seem like a pretty trustworthy guy, but do you mind if I have the signatures checked out? I think that'd be great. All right, hang out. I'll give him a call real quick, OK? Yes, sir. Steve's examination of the autographs ups the album's value beyond John's expectations. Hey, and um, what do you think about the Elton John Yellow Brick Road? It's a, a great piece to have signed by. OK. so. So, um, what do you think they're worth a piece? The Fleetwood Mac, you know, it's got a lot going on on it. It's a very nice, but I'd still put that value right at about $800. Corey calls in another expert to determine the value of the albums themselves. Punch that there could even be more value. Right. So, I got my guy Warwick in town. Do you mind if I have him take a look at him, too? Great. As much as we can learn, the better. English Mac and Fleetwood Mac rumors just exploded. They were the biggest thing in 76 and 77. Okay. Turn. From the valuation, it seems John has got himself some cash cows. John one, uh, this doesn't go for a lot because a lot of them. I'm top price on that, maybe $400. Okay. Because I like the signatures. They're real big and bold. It's a good display piece. Uh, you could get a 1000 out of that one. I think that sounds cool. John capitalizes on the new information and gets more money than he was expecting. Bucks a piece. Uh, yeah, they're worth a little bit more than that. Tell you what, I'll give you a thousand bucks for the pair. I think that's a very fair offer, and I sincerely appreciate it. Right, come with me, let's do some uh, paperwork. All right. While the new generation isn't so familiar with the classic poetry, there's still a market for it. Of a photo of and letter by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Now that's cool. Longfellow, he was the biggest there was. Unfortunately, today, I would say close to 99% of Americans can't even name a poet. <laughs> Douglas's children belong to another era. So he wants to pass the letter on to someone who knows the value of his items. I went to an auction. There was this table just full of what looked to me to be junk. May as well see what I can get for it here at the pawn shop. I was hoping to get like 300 bucks for it. The letter is exciting and makes one speculate on the happenings in the poet's life. We live in such a different society now. In the 19th century, poetry was so important. Yeah, it really it was. was. I mean, huge guy, author or a really big actor. Exactly. And he was really was a superstar back then. And I think he was the only American can ever put in there. Do you know anything about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow or any of his poems? Share below. The United States in the 19th century. Almost every kid in school in this country is about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. That poem created the legend of Paul Longfellow really was that influential. Rick needs expert valuation on the letter to know if it is something he's willing to purchase. A big concern I have here is it wouldn't surprise me if this guy got hundreds of letters every day. I don't know if he can yeah. respond to every one um, of them. If you can hang out for a little bit here, I, I would like to get my friend down here to take a look at it. I have a friend that's a handwriting expert. Yeah. He's the most respected people in this field. Hang out a few minutes. I'm going to go give him a call. Cool. And um... and Steve tells Rick what he wants to hear. The ink's running out. And the ink's running out of the quill. Cool no doubt about the ink on here. So that's one good sign, OK? On this example, yours very truly. We see yours very truly. I mean, we're looking at live ink. So it's all legit. Absolutely. There's no question about it. As 
As for the value of the framed letter, Steve gives an appraisal that blows Douglas away. Naming everything included, right around $1,500. Cool. Cool? Good luck. Good to thanks, see man. you. Yep. Hey, cool. Thanks yeah. so much. You bet, man. Take care. And just like that, Douglas leaves the store with a more considerable profit than he expected. I'd like to see 900 bucks for it. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 700 bucks. Yeah, let's do 700. Sweet. Thank you, sir. Sienna collects vintage rock posters. She wants to sell and shows her impressive collection to Corey. Which of the artists do you know? But I wanted to show you. So on the end here, we have Willie Nelson. That's his calling card. And then as we found this artist right here, Jim Franklin. Huge in the Austin music scene. He's really big into that hippie movement when like having long hair was like the worst thing you could do. Corey likes the collection, but gets an expert to verify their authenticity as Sienna is asking for a tidy sum. Bo Diddley right up there with B.B. King. But I mean, this guy played with Chuck Berry. Um... Hey, Albert King, ZZ Hill. This one feels a little bit light. You managed to keep these things in really, really good shape. Uh, how much are you looking to get out of all these? Thinking 3,300. Okay. Leah checks out the posters and several indications indicate their authenticity. So one thing that Jim Franklin is known for is that he never made correct Jewish drawings after he finished. You can see here where there's an ink blob and he just left that. Someone was faking this up. They'd probably correct that and make it look nice and, you know. I would say these are, in my opinion, all authentic. Because they're in good condition, they're worth quite a bit. Sienna's happy to hear Leah's verdict as she will be getting more than she originally bargained for. Altogether, all of them, I'd say 4,900. Okay, well, a little bit better than you that thought, Sounds right? good. <laughs> Kevin has a cool helmet he wants to offload and is hoping to make a reasonable sum of money off of it. Hoping to sell the helmet today here for about $750. Man, this thing is sexy. I'm by far no expert on these, but it looks- Jumley doesn't know the helmet enough and decides to call an expert. How much are you looking to get? Uh, I want to get $750. Um, honestly, I don't know if it's worth $750. If it's real, it could be worth more than that. Sounds great. All right, find something to buy. Bob verifies the authenticity of the helmet and gives more background knowledge on it. An authentic Anglo-Saxon helmet. But to find one in this condition, you just don't find it. This is what it should be made out of. Okay. It's official? It's a one in a million. Chumley isn't sure there's a market for the helmet, but Bob reassures him. Kevin is shocked by the appraisal as it is a long way from his initial ass. Man, I've got something that nobody else has. It's very desirable. All right, and most important question, what's it worth? A lot, $15,000. $15,000. $15,000. Negotiations start and Bob rejects 10 times the initial ass. The expert said a uh, 15,000, so I think we'll start at 15,000. One in a million find. I'm not gonna be able to pay you 15,000 for it. You gotta give me some room in here. What, what, give me a good number that you- How about, uh, how about- Bob and Chum Lee reach an agreeable price and the former leaves the store with 10 grand 95 come up a little bit more than 95 i know uh ten thousand dollars ten big ones i'm not gonna let it walk over 500 so for ten thousand dollars you have ten thousand dollars it's yours here i'll meet you over at the counter a customer brings his antique derringer to the store i'd like you to check uh, out one of those little derringer ones huh definitely really cool do we get it yeah go for it all right yeah Corey knows a bit about the tiny gun but more is needed to make a valuation it became the name for small gun oh. there is actually a company out there called Darren, but uh i don't think this one's a derringer so what are you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get 300 for it. Alex is intrigued by the gun, but wants to test it before giving value to it. If it works, it might be worth more than the customer wants. This is a 22 rimfire Derringer that he was known to make. He only made it from 1869 because only a couple thousand were ever made. Cool to test fire it if you're open to that because I'd rather do that before I give you a value. Um, are you cool? Sure, yeah, I'd love to. This is a tiny gun, but it still gets the job done. Got it.